All right, hey, eighth grade. So <clears throat> today we finished up uh, seafloor spreading with uh, a couple diagrams and things like that. So today we took a look at, believe it or not, this is a diagram of the earth. Um, what's going on here? Uh, and so I drew this step by step in the earlier ones. So essentially what needs to happen, go ahead and grab a notebook, get that out. And we're going to draw our different layers that we over, have over here. And we're going to talk about them. Um, so what I have right here, here's my earth. Um, here's the crust of it, okay? So the thinnest layer that we have here is the crust. Um, this is also called the lithosphere. If you guys uh, went ahead and did that quizlet the other day, you'll find that. It's called the lithosphere. This is really what our tectonic plates are, okay? The, the 12 individual plates that make up the surface of the earth that are all moving independently of each other, crashing into each other, pulling away from each other, rubbing up against each other, okay? And then after our, our crust, um, so again, this guy can be between 40, 40 kilometers thick and 75 kilometers thick, depending where it's at. So it's pretty thin. Um, and then we have our mantle. So this is our big red portion right here. Um, part of the mantle is our upper mantle, which we call the asthenosphere. Okay. Our asthenosphere, if you guys can see all the way over here, is a semi-solid. Um, we call it a plastic layer. So why is it called a plastic layer um, or a semi-solid? Because this is the part. So uh, our mantle down here, this is a liquid. Uh, it's really hot. It's magma. And then as we get higher and higher, it gets cooler and cooler. So as it begins to cool down, it begins to solidify. However, we know that rocks from last chapter are made of uh, a bunch of different elements, right? A bunch of different minerals and other things. So that means some of them will have higher melting points and some of them will have lower melting points in that solid. And so what's going to happen is some of that stuff here is going to be in liquid form because it has a low melting point while some of the other stuff has a high melting point will be in a solid. And so when we get those two liquids and solids together, it makes like this putty, um, a slow, very viscous uh, liquid, semi-liquid, not really, right? Or semi-solid, I should say. Okay. Um, and then after that, sorry, I got a couple other things that we we're talking about at the end of class on here. So our asthenosphere is our upper mantle. Then we have this entire guy called the mantle. Uh, the lower mantle is a liquid. Um, and then here's our, uh, in, here's our core right here. So we have two layers to our core. Our first outer layer is uh, liquid. So this guy's pretty warm. And then our inner layer here, or inner core here, is solid iron, actually. And so if you ever, um, our two cores here, our outer core and our inner core, they're actually spinning around each other. Okay, and as they spin and they create this, uh, they actually create a magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field, and that's kind of what these, that's what these are, okay? And they create this magnetic field, and this magnetic field is actually really protective. It's good for us. We need it. Like, we actually absolutely have to have it. Um, we actually believe uh, Mars used to have a structure like this, um, and we they had a magnetic field, and this magnetic field, what it is, is a, it's a shield against the sun. So the sun spits out more than just sun. It spits out um, rays, uh, radioactive ra or, uh, really harmful radiation. Um, and a lot of that harmful radiation is blocked by this magnetic field, which Mars does not have anymore. And which is why we believe that the, a lot of the water vaporized off the surface or is tied up in the ice caps. Uh, but yet we still have life flourishing on here because we are protected by this magnetic field. Um, and so then a couple questions about this, where you see like this little illustration right here. So how do we know that we have the crust, the mantle, which is composed of a semi-solid, and then it becomes liquid, and then a liquid, and then a solid again? Uh, how do we know this? We've only drilled, the deepest we've ever drilled into Earth is about seven miles, all right? And there's a lot, hundreds and hundreds of miles between the crust and the inner core, hundreds of miles. So what do we, how do we know this? Well, actually, when an earthquake happens on one side of the Earth, we have instruments all over the world that are listening to the inside of the earth for earthquakes and things like that. And so anytime this happens, shock waves are sent all around the world. And these guys will pick them up, obviously, at different times because a wave has to travel with a given time. And if it reaches this guy first, this guy first, this guy first, and so on. So they have these complex mathematic uh, calculations that tell them how fast the wave is moving. Did the wave slow down? Did it speed up? Because uh, sound waves or any other kinds of waves, they travel through different substances with different densities at different rates. Um, and so that's just a quick definition of how we actually know what this guy's made up of because we can track uh, 
seismic waves and seismic activity traveling through the Earth and calculate how fast they're going and if they're changing speed as they're going through Earth. Okay, so there's that guy. So there, there's your first that, that needs to be drawn. And this is important because now we're going to move on to our seafloor spreading. Um, and we should already have a decent amount of knowledge on this guy, on our seafloor spreading. Let's see how well you guys can see that here. Okay. So we have our seafloor spreading here. And so the first thing I started off with was right here. So this is hot molten. So we have hot molten liquid magma that's less dense. So we know that uh, if you take a lava lamp, for example, um, if you take that lava lamp and you turn it on, all of that stuff is at the bottom first, all of that goo or whatever it is. And then that lamp turns on. That lamp is actually a heat lamp. It's meant to heat that material up. As something heats up, it expands ever so slightly and becomes less dense. As it becomes less dense than the material around it, we all know that it will rise. And so this hot material becomes less dense and begins to rise. And it has one of two directions where it can go. One is where we see our seafloor spreading, where it comes out at the top here. It bubbles out at the top. The magus, magma spills out of the ridge. It hardens and becomes new crust, right? And this is what we've been talking about. Um, as that happens, the creation of that new crust causes the older crust to then move away right? And the crust, and then it form, or sorry, that older crust then just moves away, away, away. Um, and then we can also see like our magnetic striping pattern here, right? So as this is a liquid, if our magnetic north is in nor normal polarity, right? Our uh, bits of little iron that are in this magma are oriented in this direction. But then let's say that a uh, hundred thousand years later, our magnet, our, our north and south pole switch again and it's pointing the opposite direction and now we have new magma that's bubbling out for 10,000 years and all of this new magma that's bubbling out as now all of this iron that's in here is pointing the opposite directions and so this is how we get these bands that we actually can't see we can't see with the naked eye we need special equipment to detect these different magnetic variations in the C4. Um, and we've had it draw, like literally attach it to a cable and then drag it across the seafloor so that that magnometer can detect those variations or those magnetic striping patterns. So um, that's one option where the magma comes out and forms new crust. Option two is not all of it can come out of here. So what has to happen? Well, we have this, some of this magma is deflected along the bottom of the plate. So this magma jets out this way or goes this way. And this is something else that helps pull this plate away from the mid-ocean ridge. Um, <clears throat> as it gets further away from the core where it's really hot down here, right? Here's our core, it's super duper hot. It heats the material up. And then as the material gets further away from its heat source, just like a lava lamp, right? Once that material reaches the top, it may hang out there for a couple seconds or whatever. Uh, it begins to cool down. Okay, so this magma cools, and as it cools, right, it's really if it's hot, it's really energetic and it expands slightly. But as it cools, it slowly shrinks, and if it shrinks, it becomes more dense. As it becomes more dense than the material around it, it begins to fall back to the core, and then this begins to uh, falls back to the core where it warms up again. It rises goes along the bottom, cools down, becomes dense, and then we get in the cycle. This cycle right here is called the convection current, and you do need to know what a convection current is and how it operates. You do need to know this, all of this going on right here. Okay? Um, so then, if we come over here now, and we look at, sorry, hopefully nobody got sick during that trip, so then over here, we have our plates that are moving away from the mid-ocean ridge. Mid -ocean ridge. Um, and then what we got going on here is we have a continent, okay? And so, and this is homework for 7th and 8th grade. Um, but we have our continental shelf here where we have a subduction zone. So subducting is when one plate goes beneath the other while it pushes up and it causes uplift for another one. So we're actually seeing um, <clears throat> mountain making going on here. So as the oceanic crust like this guy subducts beneath the continental crust, uh, uplift happens. 
and mountains begin to form. And this is how we see a lot of our mountains form. Okay? And so really that's the big thing. This is the mechanism for how um, all of our continents, how all of the plates are able to move is through this mechanism of seafloor spreading. This is what the mechanism is that Alfred Wegener was missing out on. And then this guy named Harry Hess was actually able to come up with uh, the theory of seafloor spreading. Um, so that's the diagrams that we drew in class today. Uh, we didn't have any homework, but we'll begin on. Um, so we do have a quiz next Tuesday. So school, we don't have school on Martin Luther King Day. Next, excuse me, next Monday. So then what we began after that is uh, we did longitude and latitude. And so um, essentially what I did here is we just did a quick little lesson. It was about 10, 15 minutes. But uh, what I wanted to first go over is the true size of these continents. So it's like, why is... So if I actually, we look at Greenland here, right? Here's the United States. Here we are. And then we see Greenland up here. Greenland looks absolutely massive. Right? Um, but let's take a look. Is Greenland actually that size? Um, and you guys might have done this in the past with other classes. But if I grab this guy and I bring him down here, look how the size shrinks compared now to the U.S. If I brought the U.S. up here, right? If I compared them how they are right now, it looks like Greenland's bigger than the U.S. But as I bring him down here, he's definitely like a third of the size of the United States. And if I keep on bringing him down to the equator, he gets the smallest. All right. And the farther away we get from the equator, the bigger or the more distorted these uh, continents get on a flat map like this. And so what's the reason for this? Well, the reason is, is anytime I try to take a three dimensional object, so a sphere like our Earth, and I peel off this layer and I want to stick it to a flat surface, that's just not going to work because around the equator, there's much more material than there is up here around the pole, right? Once all of this stuff runs into the tip of the pole, there's a little bit of material. And so what has to happen is the illustrator, whoever makes the map, has to then stitch the image together. And when he stitches the image together, he has to stretch out the continents or the things towards the pole. So if I look here... Uh, Let's see if I get a good image here. Let's see. Sorry, I should have had this, but I wanted to show you real fast. But anyways, it's not super... Um, doesn't have, you don't have to know that. It was just something I brought into the lesson. So anyways, let's go ahead on with this. So what we need to do is we're talking about lines of latitude and lines of longitude. So latitude. So how do we know what latitude is? Latitude is north and south lines. So our lines of latitude are actually these guys right here. This is a line of latitude. The equator is a line of latitude, line of latitude, line of latitude. And so how do I remember this? My line of latitude runs like a ladder. Okay. Oh, man, these rungs are just awful. I wouldn't jump on this ladder. But anyways, you get what I mean. If I'm climbing a ladder, these are my lines of, of latitude here. Okay. So there we have it. Those are your lines of latitude, and they measure north and south. Now, let me take all of that ink off. Um, and so then our lines of longitude must be the opposite. And these guys are east and west. And so they measure this way. So this way is east and this way is west. Right? And so... If I wanted to, let's say, uh, one more thing. So if I'm going to write this line of, lat if I'm going to give you coordinates, like 35 degrees north by 70 degrees east or something like that, um, I need to know that when I write my coordinates, it's in parentheses and it goes latitude first. 
followed by longitude. Latitude by longitude. And so let's say I did want, I wanted to go, let's say, uh, 67.5, uh, south by uh, 45 east, let's say. If you guys want to take a time to pause this and get it real fast, you can, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. So what I need to do is I find 67.5 degrees south. Here's 67.5 degrees south. And then I find 45 east. Here's 45 east. So I follow him up to here. I follow this line. Oh, my goodness. And I find it right here. All right, so now I have found this coordinate right here. Okay, and that's not too terribly bad. So I just kind of want to, I'm, we're going to start working on this just to kind of get a feel of what the world looks like, what are the continents, and uh, and all of that good stuff about geology. Okay, um, so other than that, there wasn't any homework. Um, I did on plan book, I put uh, mapping volcanoes and mapping major earthquakes in the past and things like that. We didn't get to that today, so don't worry about that. We will get to that on Tuesday, but there is a quiz over seafloor spreading and Pangea on Tuesday. So the notes that we've already taken, the first part of the notes. Um, other than that, I'll see you guys later. Let me know if you guys have any questions.